Jewish society is a caring society. No society could continue to exist if it did not provide for a way to raise children, tend to basic needs, cope with aging, disease, and mortality. But many, or most, or perhaps all societies, also engage in forms of care that we would say are bad care, either in the sense that they do not meet the needs of people, that they actually bring harm to people, or in the sense that they exclude some people and treat them unjustly. So I must say, in my own work, increasingly I think about bad care, not about good care. Today, I want to talk about caring for older people as an example of how to think in caring terms about large political questions. I want to begin with a bit of caution about the very idea of aging itself. Oh, great, thank you. Um, after all, we're all aging, all of us. <laughs> And we have come to see that a certain segment of the population now is different because they're really older than some others. But what if we started from the assumption that there isn't something different about older people that is different and distinct? It is this premise, I think, that brings us back to this notion of ageism, as it's called. As Margaret Goulet states, dehumanization is an inevitable outcome of having a culture that relentlessly questions the value of the later life classes. When you treat people as they're different, it's going to dehumanize them. Okay, so at some point, when a group is at some point when a group is cast as having distinct characteristics and even if not all in that group have the same characteristics, they become an other. For me, one of the best ways of capturing what this difference means is in a writing about race that was done over 100 years ago by the great American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois wrote, people ask me all the time, how is it going? How is your life? How is your neighborhood? How is everybody? He said, but what they really want to ask me, but never do, is this. How does it feel to be a problem? How it feels to be a problem is to be transformed from being a person with an active control of your destiny to being a passive object of the attention of others. It is possible to take care of a problem, but it is not easy to do so democratically unless one looks at the situation from the standpoint of the so-called problems themselves. So at Kennedy Airport last week, everyone called me dear. Ah, Carina. <laughs> it's Professor Carina to you, <laughs> I wanted to say to them. Please call me Professor Carina. They, so, they go on. Some basic questions we would ask are these. What would it mean for us not to normalize the separation of older people, but to view all of society from the standpoint of older people, from their needs, wants, and desires, and to explore how current forms of bad caring might be relieved? Could it be perhaps possible to create a more caring society for everyone if we started from the standpoint of those who we treat as other. Now, I cannot answer these questions today. They're much too big and too difficult for someone like me to answer. But what I will do today is this. I will argue that we have a capacity to act as citizens. And this capacity is usually reduced uh, for senior citizens, but we can all become more about this. So here's what I thought I would do today. I'm going to focus on three concepts that are associated with caring and aging to show how the various ways of seeing them provide us with a map, perhaps different ways to loosen up the way we think about 
these people we've set aside. I will argue, it won't surprise you to know, that in the end, if we act in a more democratic way, it's likely to be better. So the three concepts I want to talk about today are burden, voice, and presence. So these are the three, and we'll go in order. OK? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the demographic crisis as a burden and care. Now, one way that we often discuss the burden of care and to talk about aging at all is to throw up data like these, which are an economic language, really. It looks like demographics. It's really economics. Mm. The aging and shrinking human population. The population is aging. Fewer young people are being born. It's a crisis. By the way, it's also a gendered crisis. You know this, yes? The aging crisis um, is a gendered crisis because there are significantly more older, older women than men. And by the way, in institutional care, what we really have is women, often older women, taking care of really old women. No wonder they are so marginalized in society. But as soon as we begin to invoke these numbers, we begin to start to talk not about individual differences, they're leveled out, but about norms and about groups and about language like the gray tsunami, the wave of old people which will conquer Europe and America and the entire North, but also is happening in the South. These shifts cry out for an economic form of analysis. And indeed, this language of economics, of counting, of making cost-benefit analyses, comes so easily to us that we hardly notice that it's actually a very strange way to think about the world. None of us live macroeconomics. We live our daily lives. Why do we let them have so much power in defining how we think? So what I'd like to do then is to talk about three approaches to studying this burden, which are economic and which might help us better understand what's going on. We, we could have four or five or six, but we'll start with just three. The first is neoliberal, and then we'll talk about two responses to it. Now, first, a neoliberal perspective um, helps people cope with demographic changes in this way. In the first place, a neoliberal might say, the market is a miracle. It will work out the problem. Don't worry. If there's new needs, the market can solve it. This is a utopian idea, really. Karl Polanyi called it such in 1944 in his book, The Great Ex... Uh, the, I didn't write the title down. The Great Transformation. Uh, it's simply an issue of knowing how well markets can meet expectations. And once we do that, then we're all set. Uh, but another way to understand what neoliberalism does is that it sees aging as a crisis to the wealthy. If the population keeps aging, then it may become necessary to raise taxes and place more of a more than modest demands upon the wealthy to provide support for the rest of society. Uh, some neoliberal economists have said, let's just solve the problem by getting rid of the idea of public support for older people. If you didn't save for a pension for yourself, too bad for you. And then we don't have to pay s things like Social Security any longer. Uh, it would certainly reduce the burden for the old. And if you're sufficiently wealthy, then you can take care of yourselves. This would help us reduce the cost. Now, there are some nicer ways that neoliberals think about the cost. Uh, for example, the colonialist past of importing scarce resources from the rest of the world to the advanced world would now have the importation of scarce, caring labor. And this is what's happening everywhere in the world. This care drain has already been studied for decades. By this account, um, th by this account, this ungenerous amount of money is already too much. 
And here's one of the things that neoliberalism does best. It helps all of us begin to lower our expectations. So young people in the United States now think that there will not be any social security system at all when they age. It's a, a frightening thought. They just presume, well, that's the way it goes. It'll just disappear before I get any benefit from it. They have no sense of solidarity uh, with other generations. It's a remarkable observation on the way that neoliberal economic thought completely permeates our way of thinking. And of course, there's one more thing to say about social security pensions. When an older family member gets money, if it's sufficient for them to live, they often share it with the rest of their family, right? They buy them food, they provide benefits for them, they provide free babysitting and so on. There are lots of resources that are, you're supporting when you support the elderly. Now, one of the things that happens then is that even people who want to be generous, who operate within this neoliberal framework, constantly have to justify any spending at all. Because the model is cut, 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 don't use government to spend. Okay. A second type of analysis, which I'll label here the welfare state version, of the care crisis is made clear in Emma Dowling's book, The Care Crisis, What Caused It and How Can We End It? This book, it's a wonderful book. If you want to read a wonderful book about how bad things are, <laughs> this one will help you understand. She talks about what she calls a fix. And this is a British language. And she says, a, fi a care fix entails the management of the care crisis in ways that resolve nothing definitively, but displace the crisis somewhere else. And where does it get displaced? It gets displaced onto people who, quoting her, on whom exactly is care work offloaded? Whose feeling of responsibility for care and whose sense of compassion are mobilized in order to keep care infrastructures afloat? under adverse conditions. So if someone's going to have to bear the burden, who's it going to be? It's going to be precisely the people who already know how to care, take care, already probably do too much care. And as the government says, oh, we can't do that anymore, the burden will shift to those who are already overburdened. Uh, she points out that for uh, the, Neoliberals and capitalists, when they cut services, they create a new low point, and then they say, oh, we have to cut more, and they cut more, and now this is the bottom, and they say, well, we have to cut more, and then this, no one ever looks back to where it started, they always just look up this little bit, and pretty soon you're in a disastrous uh, tunnel of cuts. She calls this, of course, a state of austerity, but austerity meant a period of hard times. Now it looks clear that it will never end. Austerity will just go on forever. And so she uh, ends at end by saying, value and care means allocating resources, not taking them away. Value and care means take, valuing resources, not taking them away. Now, as far as this goes, this is a very good critique of neoliberalism. But I want to be critical of it a little bit because it's still, it's still going on in the language of economics. How do we break out of this? In, in his original account of social rights, T.H. Marshall said this about social rights. Social rights are never from a position of strength. It's always from the position of being the recipient of something. There is little that consumers can do, he says. We've been turned into consumers by having social rights. And there's little that we can do except imitate Oliver Twist and ask for more. And the government hears this and thinks, oh, you're so silly. All you can do is ask for more. I'm going to ignore you. I know what really has to happen in the economy. Perhaps the most insulting piece of this is that at the moment, in the neoliberal third way, um, Dowling labels this as participatory aust austerity, and the Dutch call it participatory society. 
Now people are being asked to design where the cuts are. So the local council in the UK town is told, we have to cut the budget 10%. You decide, where should we cut? That's the level of political participation. That doesn't seem to me to be a very accurate way to understand this. Um, if you let me use this language, sometimes people criticize the welfare state for being a nanny state. Uh, in the new and mean-spirited uh, nanny state, we are told, you can't have that much, have less. It's still a nanny state. It's just a mean one. So in the face of this collapsed public sphere, one set of voices can still be heard loud and clear, uh, the wealthy. So how do we become active citizens in response to this? I think we have to try to get the language of economics to change. And that's what I shall do in this third frame, which I'll call wealth care. This appeared in a little essay I published earlier this year. And it, I like this idea, so I'll, I'll tell you about it. Let's see if you like it. Elsewhere, I've argued that what we should do is stop talking about economics and start talking about economics in terms of care. If we do that, if we ask, what do we care about when we think about economics, the answer is we care about wealth. We organize society not to take care of people, but to take care of wealth. Oh, if we do that, it'll hurt the stock market. Well, then, we shouldn't do that. I don't understand that logic. We should be saying, if it hurts people, we should stop doing it, not if it hurts the stock market. The main point of wealth care is the assertion that the production of wealth is the best way to improve human society. And so deference to the wealthy is an appropriate response to the ways in which wealth provides care. Care for wealth, not for people. It is wrong to say that wealth provides care, generating greater wealth has permitted, I'm sorry, it is not wrong to say, I should say, it's right to say, wealth is a good thing. It has made it possible for us to be healthier. Uh, we would not have been able to develop a vaccine in a, less than a year were it not for vast amounts of wealth that had accumulated over time that allowed for the training of scientists and so on and so forth, right? So wealth is a good thing. It's created public health. It's created an infrastructure of sewers. Um, all of that is good. It's created medical capacities. But the idea that wealth care is the only or the main form of worthwhile care that deserves our loyalty is the harmful one. But if there were a public space in which honest discussions of wealth care could happen, we would probably notice that there are competing points for care. When we focus on care, we obscure what else can be valuable in human societies. The idea is that those who produce wealth are the only people who are worthwhile, um, and they are all, notice, autonomous, self-caring adults, means that people who are past their careers, older people, are parasitic on society. Um, and what would it mean if we took that idea very far? But the last thing I want to mention about wealth care is that the wealthy, whether you want to talk about the 1% or the 10% of the population, who control basically about half the wealth, not just in the United States, but globally, they do not want an open discussion of this viewpoint, and they obscure it and try to limit democratic discussion of it. In this regard, as Nancy McLean's book title expresses it, we end up with what she calls democracy in chains. The political views of the wealthy are heard by politicians loud and clear, and what they think is a proper way to proceed in society is how we proceed. Otherwise, uh, democracy is quite limited. So what I've argued thus far is to talk about this first concept of burden. I've argued that if we conceive of the situation of older adults as an economic crisis, a competition for resources, the prognosis is for bad care. 
Start with the language of economics. The outcome will always be economize. But there are some other ways to view the situation that might lead to different outcomes. To do so requires that we begin from this reality. There is no single old person's experience. Some people who are old ex are affected by mental or physical conditions. Others are less so affected. Some continue to work, some are retired. Some continue to live independently, others live in institutions. Some rely upon friends or family for assistance, others pay for assistance, some really have no help at all. When we hear about a crisis for the aging population though, it almost always involves one thing, using resources, mainly public but also private, to address the fact that older people are often less able to provide complete care for themselves. But if we want to change that, we need to think more about how older people themselves might be able to go from being passive to being active. And so this leads us to the next point, to the point about voice. Um, we can say voice, or we might want to say expression, because not everybody can speak uh, and hear, but let's use voice for shorthand today. Now, of course, voice is one of the central categories of care ethics, going back to Carol Gilligan's remarkable work. Here I want to focus on voice in several registers and to conclude that it's a powerful form, a great way to make democratic processes more visible. So a central premise of feminist care ethics has been that care receivers need to be involved reciprocally in the processes of care but several barriers might prevent society from hearing the voices of older people. So here we get to these barriers. The first is prejudice. I already quoted Margaret Goulet and called it ageism. The second related is a literal separation in space and other forms of segregation, a literal segregation of the elderly. Think about it, old people have virtually no non-family interactions with people from other generations. This is especially true of infants and older people. You just don't meet them if you're old. A third way society might be able to, unable to hear the voice of older people could arise from how older people articulate their needs, wants, and desires. Older people do not want to be perceived as a burden. We come back to this notion of burden. The language of burden is so widely presented in what older people say that it is rarely at the heart of research, but the claim is ubiquitous. A study in 2009 studying semi, using semi-structured interviews discovered that more than half of the people in the United States, when just asked to talk about their experience of being older, said, I don't want to be a burden. No, notice, this form of burden is not the one I was talking about before. Before, I was talking about it from the macroeconomic level, but people do experience it psychologically. They say, I don't want my children to have to give up their lives, or I don't want my um, friends to have to come every day to see me because they have to do other things, or they should do other things, and so on. So people perceive themselves as a problem, not as um, contributors. And a fourth way that voice may be missing is that those who would advocate for older people, the care workers who work with them, the family members who are probably themselves older too, often have their voices discounted for the same reasons. And as a result, we hardly ever hear the actual voice of what older people want. Now, all of these problems of voice cannot be addressed in a framework of thinking of care as a kind of personal responsibility. If we start from the model of personal responsibility, we will never be able to address this issue of voice. Because in this model, a fake commitment to self-care, Victoria had spoken at length about self-care, becomes a way of turning a structural problem you're left aside, you're out of the economic system. 
the lights don't stay green long enough for you to cross the street. All of those are structural problems, but we turn those into a psychological problem. Oh, it's too bad you feel that you're a burden. But this isn't the only place where such an alchemical transformation occurs, but that doesn't make it less serious. One of the things I like about the concept of voice is that it is always relational. We cannot have voice without someone else or something listening and hearing it. And so how voice is received is as fundamental as having a voice itself. Indeed, I think voice is one of the most fundamental ways in which we can think non-economically about power, and especially power in institutions. Here I refer back to the remarkable work of Albert Hirschman, the economist, he's an economist, in his book, Exit Voice Loyalty. Here's what Hirschman said. When you're in an institutional setting, whether it's a family or a corporation or your Latin American country vis-a-vis -vis the United States, when something goes wrong in the relationship, you have three options. You can leave, you can exit, you can say what's wrong and ask for some redress, or you can just be loyal. Say, okay, it's not getting better, I better just go along. And what's interesting is that the choice you make, whether to leave, voice, or express loyalty, depends partly on how serious the problem is, but it also depends on what the costs are to you of doing one of these three things. The great feminist scholar Susan Oaken used this as a way to recognize the, cost, the problem of mar in marriages when divorce was very expensive. So in the United States prior to the 1970s, uh, if a woman divorced and left her husband, she had to leave behind the children, the house, the money, the bank accounts, and go off with nothing. So many women just stayed put and were beaten, had unhappy lives, because they, it was too costly for them to leave. Once the laws for divorce changed and it was possible to divide the property, say, well, it's true more women divorced, but more women also exercised voice. More women were willing then to say to their husband, I'm not completely happy here. We need to make some changes. And as you change one of the costs of exit voice or loyalty, you change the whole atmosphere of what's going on. So obviously, the way we've structured institutions will make the different options more or less expensive. If you're working at the bottom in an organization that's very big, it may be so costly to you to uh, say, you know, we should do this differently, that it's cheaper for you to quit and find another job than to stay. But if jobs are scarce, then you will stay, you'll be unhappy, uh, but you will exercise loyalty rather than an exit. Does that make sense to you? You see how this works? Now let's turn the question to a democratic one. One way to understand how democratic institutions should function is that they should make sure that the cost of voice is low. Because if you let more people speak, then you'll have a more democratic outcome. Uh, sometimes you can do that by lowering the cost of exit. Sometimes you can do it by increasing the value of voice. So this changing cost of exit voice and loyalty will shape how and why successful older people can stop feeling like a burden. It will also help to explain how workers in care work might differently evaluate their work. Because right now, at least in most of the world, here in Spain too, I think, there's a problem where care workers are just quitting. They're just leaving. They're exercising their exit. Yes, they are exercising their exit option and leaving. Uh, I'll give you a, ca a case study here. A study in Belgium looked closely, the title of the work was Over the Shoulders of the Trainees. And what they did is they followed nurse 
students who had gone for their first rotation in the hospital. And many of them, after spending one month in the hospital, decided they no longer wanted to be nurses. What a waste and what a tragedy that these people who had spent all this time training in this profession now said, oh, no, I will not do this work. And they went and opened shops to sell candles and other things. Okay, <laughs> why did they do this? When they went to the hospital, the hospital staff, the, the researchers discovered, the hospital staffs had been so cut back because it's cheaper to cut staff and then run your hospital. How many nurses do we need for 20 patients? Mm, six, mm, five, mm, four. And then pretty soon, they're stretched so thin that when the new trainees came, they were either given very trivial work to do, go clean that toilet, or very difficult nurse to, nursing work to do, go put an IV in that lady's arm. I never did this before, how am I going to do that? And either way, the trainees felt like they weren't being supported, they weren't being treated as a person of value, and if this was going to be their professional life, they didn't want it, and so they quit. How much more would we save by having not cut those staff members, making sure that the new trainees are properly trained and so that we don't waste that money? If there'd been a voice option present, they might have done different, but there was nowhere in the hospital for them to express their view that they were not being trained well. And so they left the profession. Uh, exit voice loyalty is a democratic and political solution to the problem that some voices are never heard or heeded. It helps to lessen the possibility of bad care for older people by making it possible that older people and their advocates will be heard. Now, just a little footnote. In the past, I've said, I think hierarchy is a bad thing, and I do. But I also think that Sophie Bourgo's critique of me was right. She said, sometimes with hierarchy comes accountability and responsibility. So I would say now, we shouldn't be concerned only with hierarchy, but we should be concerned with making sure that if we're in a hierarchical organization, even from the bottom, the voices can be heard up. So that's the second concept, the concept of voice. Let's move on to the third, presence. What I want to do is to ask the question, what is really required to care well for older people? Starts from the articulations of theirs not wanting to be a burden, from the material circumstances, and now to compare it with an earlier period of history when people cared differently for older people. In a book published in 2021 called Communities of Care, The Social Ethics of Victorian Fiction. Yes, she read novels to learn uh, about life. Um, Talia Schaefer described communities of care, which arose across class and gender as people came to the bedside of ailing individuals to comfort them. They had no medicine, they had no magic, all they had was the capacity to sit and hold the hand and maybe make it warmer or colder, but there was no other option as to what to do for sick people. Their presence, not their active engagement in care work, was what made them members of this community of care. And the community of care wasn't people who necessarily even liked each other, but they all felt a commitment to this one person, and so there they were, present. Now, changing concept, context is often a way to gain some insight. And when we think about how we have substituted the highly professional presence of medically skilled individuals for the comfort provided by a neighbor, a family member, a friend, there's a very different valence to what presence means as a person's life becomes genuinely precarious and the person vulnerable towards death. There's no guarantee even that the caregiver, made such by their presence and not by their 
expertise can offer anything besides just being there. And indeed, in the most poignant moments in the early COVID weeks, doctors and nurses reported that sometimes all they could do would be present when the person died. Now such presence is a very difficult form of care, perhaps made more difficult because there's so little that can be done, but such presence requires deep sacrifice on the part of us who would be present, a sacrifice of time and perhaps also of emotional distance from suffering and sadness. Our busyness, as well as our business, makes such presence rare in the modern age. When people ask what I mean about when I said that in a democracy we would engage in caring with other people, I didn't articulate it this way, but this is a key element of what solidarity is, being present for others. We would expect a caring democracy to provide the conditions for people to have presence in the lives of those who matter. It would also require that we recognize sacrifices. And it would also require, and here we get political again, we would need to see ongoing sacrifices, such as the kind of deep historical grievings that some groups, some people, some individuals engage in and are part of the caring mosaic of any ongoing society. Some are much more likely to have their presence needed than others, as many African American scholars have written. Christina Sharp, in her book, In the Wake. Do you know what the wake is? Wake has two meanings, two, well, many, but two meanings in English that she's invoking. One, it's the, it's the opportunity, it's the little gathering before the funeral where members of the public can speak to the family. It's called a wake. But the wake is also the trail of water that the boat leaves behind as it's traveling. That's called a wake as well. And she's talking about the wake of the Middle Passage, of the slavery system, where millions of people died being transported from Africa to the Americas. And that burden, she says, that sacrifice still sits upon the lives of people who grew up in societies that were funded by wealth, the wealth of slavery. One way to improve our sense of solidarity may well be to insist upon forms of presence that are outside the normal frames of our life. Now presence may seem straightforward, but actually to be present with another, with an older person who might be fragile or suffer from dementia or be dying, requires a difficult commitment that goes against all the directions of modern life. It requires, above all, time. In order to take care of older people by being present, we would need to reorganize deep structural aspects of our society. And this would require sacrifice. So whose sacrifice should we ask for and whose should we excuse? These are the kinds of questions I think a democratic people would have to face if they wanted really to care well for older people. So, concluding thoughts. We live in cultures where we rarely pay attention to these critical aspects of life, to the crisis of burden, voice, and presence. But if we think about it, this is the most radical of demands. Emphasizing these non-economic, relational ways to think about what care is and why it matters helps us to keep from being enthralled with the omnivorous powers of neoliberal ways of being in the world. An emphasis on democratic caring, about what caring and aging can mean in such a society will help us make our caring practices less bad, more just. Here's the good news. We are not without resources to resolve these questions. We have solutions sitting around. We can try to reshape bad care. We can start by reorganizing time. And Jennifer Nadelsky and Tom Mallison in their book, Part-Time for All, have argued that nobody should work more than 30 hours a week, and everybody should have to care for 30 hours a week, whether you're a doctor 
or a garbage collector, mm -hmm. you have to do the same amount of care work. So too will be more commoning practices uh, seeking conviviality. Among the Maori people of New Zealand, when someone invites, wants to do research with the Maori people, the Maori people say that one of the questions they have to answer is this, how will your research and results show love for the people and for future generations? Can you imagine if we asked our public policy analysts? You can do that, but first you have to answer the question, how does your research show love for the people and for future generations? It's actually a really good question, uh, but it sounds crazy to us because we think in economic terms. And so there are all these things that we can do. But look, I, we have forgotten how to be active citizens. If we keep the polar star of democratic inclusion firmly within our vision, we can move forward. In truth, we have all forgotten how to be citizens, reshaping our thinking around the kinds of questions about older people, about ourselves, about children, about people who have disabilities. <clears throat> thinking about all people in the ways I've suggested may provide us with a way to think and act more clearly again. And perhaps the effects will be beneficial. And to this end, I end with an incantation. Then we may all age well. Thank you very much. Thank you.